Hey everybody, welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast with your host, me, Nicole Simonin. In today's podcast, I have a very special guest on today and I am so excited to share with you the podcast because she spills her personal story with addiction and how it affected her family and her life and how to be resilient in a world that comes crashing down around you. And I think that right now in this time, it is um, in March of 2020 where the coronavirus is in full lockdown and full effect, the tips that she offers and the motivation that she inspires of people through this podcast are so worth just diving into. And in the podcast, there are three questions my special guest is going to share with you on key ways to approach a crisis and to really kind of handle the crisis 15 minutes at a time. So without further ado, here is today's podcast. So welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. I am so thrilled today for our special guest that we have. So welcome, Mary Fran Bontempo. She is an award-winning two-time... TEDx speaker, author, humorist, and podcast host who teaches audience to uncover their brilliance and resilience 15 minutes at a time. A sought after presenter, Mary Fran is the author of The 15 Minute Master, The Woman's Book of Dirty Words, and co founder of Brilliantly Resilient Online Video Show and Podcast. So, welcome, Mary Fran. I'm so excited that you are here. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Good. And I actually met you a couple weeks ago um, at your Brilliantly Resilient event in Pennsylvania. And it was interesting because someone had shot it to me at like the last minute. And I was like, oh, I don't know. It's an hour away. Actually, it was more than an hour away. And I was like, I don't know if I want to drive up there. And But I did anyway. And I was so glad that I did because um, I just loved yours and Kristen's stories and how you were so vulnerable and authentic and sharing them with everyone of the audience because it's nothing against teenagers, but it was like <laughs> women of the same tribe. age. You were with <laughs> your tribe. <laughs> right. <laughs> People that understood and get what it is to be over 40. A great experience, and I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to go up there, and I'm so glad I took the step to actually go to the event and meet you guys, and I'm so thrilled that you are here today. I'm so glad that you came too. In fact, our initial meeting and i'll use the air quotes here was was with me sitting in the acme parking lot and you had gotten my phone number and called and said i didn't get my email confirmation and i'm going like all right i'll uh, we'll try to figure this out i just came out of the acme and you know so there's no pretense about that at all but i appreciate the fact that you drove as far as you did because this all happened on march 7th which was right before the world shut down right. um and we had a great turnout that day and talk about the content being timely, we didn't realize in that moment how timely the idea of resilience was going to be. So right. at any rate, thank you for coming to that and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Good. So has the coronavirus affected you in any way? Like, Well, I mean, you know, there's the obvious stuff. Um, everybody is social distancing and all that. But we have, uh, Kristen and I have taken the opportunity to do things and put things into place with the whole brilliantly resilient thing um, that we were planning on doing down the road, you know, like, Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. we'll do it. We'll do a video show and blah, blah, blah. And we'll, we'll make it look real pretty and all that. And now we were just like, you know what, let's just do this. So we are doing that. So it's, it's oddly enough. And I think this happens when people, their, their routines are taken away. There's a, there's a benefit to routine and there's the downside of it, which is that you get stuck in a routine. So when I think that's taken away, I think there's an opportunity for creativity, which, um, which has, is really important. And I think that's the kind of stuff that fuels once all of this awfulness goes away, (laughs) I think we will find that people have really found some really interesting, creative things and come up with them and they're coming up with them now, you know? So, um, I, I'm grateful that I have the home that I have to be in. Of course, I miss my family and my little grandbabies. I have mm. six of them. What? Oh, wow. That happened. I mean, I don't... <laughs> right. What? Oh. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, I'm trying to, t- we, we talk about, when Chris and I talk about the whole brilliantly resilient thing, we talk about resetting. 
Mm. So I'm trying to take this moment to reset and figure out what's going on and, and just play around with things and try things. I mean, why not? What have we got to lose at this point? Right, right. So that's one of the things that I like in, so my business, I help women over 40 get fit. And I think a lot of women over 40 don't like to step out of their comfort zone uh -huh. and they feel very comfortable. Kind of like you're saying, they have a routine, they have a structure. And I think when things like this happen, it's not just you're stepping out, you're being shoved out yes. of the comfort zone <laughs> yeah. and you either sink or swim. And I yeah. think as being you know, resilient and trying to overcome whatever everybody has their own individual things that they're overcoming in this situation. Um, I just think that it just, it almost like forces you to be like, get out of your comfort zone and to level up and become a better version of yourself, which I think we all need to do, you know? Yeah, I think that's true. And I, and I think the other beauty about right now is that we're all figuring this out as we go along. So there are no rules. You're not going to break any rules by trying something different because everybody has to try something different. We're, right. we're everything about life has pretty much changed at this point. So, you know, it, it, there's no better time than the present to start to get physically fit. In fact, you know, speaking to that point, um, I, I, for many, many, many years, walked every day, did yoga and all that kind of stuff. Well, then as my life changed a little bit, I got less committed to that routine. And now I'm kind of going back to it again and Good. trying to make sure that that, that idea of physical fitness, and, and we have to be physically fit right now. It's an important thing for all yes. of us. So I'm trying to work that back into my life. So, <laughs> you know, it's an opportunity to do those things that maybe you kind of let go by the wayside that are, I think most of us, women in particular, we, we tend to look outwards. We're like, how can I help? How can I help everybody else? How can I do this for right. everybody else? And fitness and all of that is something that for me, that's one of the first things that goes, that regular routine of it. Mm. So now, since I've been at it more often, I'm like, no, this is really important. This feels good. My body's getting stronger. I feel good about it. So I think using this time to again, reset and, and maybe institute something like that that's going to benefit just you, but then in the long run benefits everybody because you're better right. and stronger and sharper and all that. It's a good time to do those things. Yeah, exactly. Um, I always tell people that like if you're helping others, because as women, I think we tend to be more people pleasers and yeah. we're always trying to, like you said, help more people. But when you are kind of quote unquote selfish and take care of yourself, you are so much better helping other people. So it's, yeah. even though you feel like it might be selfish to work out, I feel like you doing that, even though you think it's selfish, you are helping more people in the long run. So. Well, you can come at life just from a better place. I mean, it, it, you just have to look at anything about the science to see how it raises the levels of serotonin and dopamine and all those things that are those feel good chemicals. I mean, and who doesn't need that in your brain at this point? Yeah, you know, exactly. we're, we hear nothing but bad news. So, you know, if you can do something to lift yourself out of that place. And I, you know, I personally struggled with anxiety and depression for my whole life, my uh -huh. whole life, that's been a problem for me. Um, and I come from a long line of neurotics. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gene pool thing, you know. But, um, but you have to be conscious of that and you have to recognize that in yourself if that's something that you have in your, in your world. And just as you said, I, I hate when people say that, that it's, it's selfish because we look at it that way because anything we think that it, that involves us, but you can't function at your best, which means you're not giving your best to anyone else if you're not feeling well. And that right. requires some self-care. Right. You know, that requires that. And, and for me, throughout my life with dealing with anxiety and depression, exercise has been one of those things that I hate doing it. But <laughs> after I'm done... I feel great. Right. So, you know, just start, start. Right. Right. And I think too, I know for me personally, I've been diving into more of the mental aspect or the psychology mm -hmm. part of it lately. Um, and it's fascinating to me how, what we think is true or what our beliefs are, are really in fact, just kind of holding us back. Yeah. Um, and I think moving forward is, 
definitely going to help with the mental health and just kind of being aware of what you're bringing into your life. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you shared at the event with your son, if that's okay. Oh yeah, of course. Um, so on, well, my son is now, how old is he? <laughs> <laughs> He's 34. He'll be 35 at the beginning of April. Um, and he, um, he was one of those kids who was incredibly bright and, and just really personable, just a great little kid. But as he got a little bit older, um, and even when he was younger, he, I think, experienced really almost crippling periods of self-doubt and a lack of self-confidence and self-esteem. And I'm not quite sure why. And, and I don't, it was certainly was not anything. My husband and I were not pressuring him or that was just never, just never us, you know, it was always just do the best you can, but for whatever reasons, and I still don't presume to know what they are. Um, he started when he was young, he was drinking and then it progressed to trying uh, drugs and that started with with Percocets and pills mm. and stuff that he could get his hands on, um, and then it went to oxycodone and that stuff is Highly wildly addictive. addictive. Yeah. It's horrifying that that stuff's been allowed out even as a even as a acceptable medical. medical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, and then unfortunately the trajectory of that is it's expensive so then they turn to heroin so on mother's day of 2010 my son overdosed on a pain medicine that he had actually taken because he couldn't get his hands on heroin that day but that was the day i learned that he was a heroin addict mm -hmm. and he overdosed we got him to the hospital thank god but the doctors told us that if they could not reverse the effects of what he had taken because it was very high in acetaminophen mm -hmm. that he would need a liver transplant if he oh, lived wow mm. so this was mother's day yeah you know you're supposed to be getting macaroni necklaces for my kids <laughs> right right and chocolate and flowers yeah. and so you know i ended up spending mother's day sitting trying to sleep on this little two seat hospital waiting room bench and wondering if my son was going to make it yeah um, so that, you know, that experience brings your life to a crashing halt right. and everything that you thought you knew about who you were and where you were going and what you had, you thought created, you know, mm, right. in this world that you had, it just comes crashing down. It just disappears. So he survived, thank God, that experience. Um, he did not need a liver transplant, thank God. Um, but that was the, well, I don't want to say it was the beginning of our journey because unfortunately we had been, he had been struggling for a long time, but it was the beginning of the definitive part of it where we knew we were dealing with heroin addiction mm. of, of going into rehabs and trying to figure out how to get him well and trying to navigate a world that we had zero experience in right so right. you yeah there's no handbook for that no, no no there really isn't and and i mean even though there are you know there are commonalities in it every case is different and and by virtue of the fact that every family is different you know right. you just your your relationships with that person are different so it, it was just um it was it was world shaking it was world shaking and it really changed the trajectory of everything from that point on. Mm. Right. We, um, uh, we just had no idea where we were going. Now, looking back, do you find it interesting that like if that situation hadn't happened, that you wouldn't be where you are today? You know, I, I love that question because I would not, first of all, and while I am very grateful for everything that's in my life today, I will never look back on that time. Like some people go, oh, it was a blessing. I'm like, nope, mm, no, it wasn't. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. It was not a blessing. <laughs> I see now why it happened. Right. I see now what I can do with it. But I would have been okay if it didn't happen. <laughs> if it didn't happen, yeah. I would have been fine with that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things that we learned from this, and, and by we, I mean not only my son and myself, but my husband, my whole family, all of us, we all talk about this 
all the time. We talk about it very publicly. Mm -hmm. We talk about it to anyone because when you go through, this has kind of become my philosophy. When you go through a challenging, painful experience, unless you turn it outside of yourself and try to help other people with it, it just becomes this lump Yes, it sort of yeah. sits in you. Yeah, and I and 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 I'm not saying that you have to immediately after your trauma go out and start preaching to the world and healing the sick and all that. I'm not saying that because you right. have to process it. You have to give yourself the grace to process it and figure out what your role is in that. And it may not be, it may not be that you go right into that field. I mean, I've chosen to go into that field. I work with um, David. Actually, um, works in the recovery field now oh, okay. for a company called Dream Life recovery. Um, and I work with that company. Now I do blogs, I do videos, I talk to parents all of the time. Um, because, you know, we've chosen to be active in that world. But I'm not suggesting that everybody has to do that. What I am suggesting is find some way to take what you've gone through and turn it out of yourself. Don't let it sit there. It's, it's right. not going to do you any good. It'll right. just be something that you hang on to and you don't want that. So even if, you know, even if you've gone through something like this and you decide to go work at a soup kitchen, that has nothing to do with, you know, that. Do yeah. It. Yeah, Do no, something I, that gets it out. Right. I agree. Cause I feel like it's, um, when big things like that happen, I think that depending on, you know, the situation, but there's a shame part to it mm -hmm. and like, and you holding on to it, it kind of festers and it just turns into this ugliness. And some people, like, I think the more you shove it down too, the more it's going to explode later on. Like it just builds up steam until, you know, you're either have mental problems that you can't mm -hmm. deal with or you're taking out on other outlets. Um, but yeah, <laughs> or other people, or other people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Now, um, you wrote the 15 minute book in mm -hmm. out of what had happened, correct? I did. Um, I have a, a f when all of this went down, um, I, again, was not prepared to process it because I was just going through it. And it took me, it took me a long time to be able to talk about this freely and openly because there is, there is post-traumatic stress associated mm -hmm. with all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's another way that exercise helps to relieve that kind of thing. You know, sure. you know, people go out and they run, they run, they're running away from things. They eventually come back, but they're running away from stuff. And, and it does help to do that. But um, there was a period of time where I needed to not be thinking about that and have some lightness in my life. So my initial couple of, of books were, were much more light in tone. And, and this one's got, is humorous too, but it's grounded in something different. So the first two, two books, I've actually written four. The first book was a compilation of newspaper columns. The second one and the third one were based in the not ready for granny panties thing. Right. So I did read the granny panties one. That was just so funny. And actually I loved, I actually highlighted it. Um, I'm going to quote you. <laughs> okay. I love it when people quote. I wish my children would quote me more. Um, what struck me was that you wrote further by evaluating ourselves and encouraging everyone else in our lives to manage their own stuff, freeing us from an infinite list of shoulds. We give ourselves the opportunity to contribute to the world in ways that may be exponentially more satisfying to us and to those who might benefit from our efforts. Wow, um, I wrote that? You did. <laughs> it's on page 63 on my I notes. So. that up. <laughs> <laughs> should make that into a meme. <laughs> right? I should. Um, so, yeah, I think what happens to us and with us, and it's very, it's very natural and it all comes from a good place. You know, as parents, as even just as women, you don't have to be a parent to have this mindset. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we go outside of ourselves and we want to help people and we want to fix things. But what ends up happening is we take on other people's stuff mm -hmm. and instead of enabling them to do their own thing, we think we're helping by taking it on. And while in some instances that's necessary, when it becomes the norm that we are taking on everybody else's stuff, we are, we're doing so much harm, not only to them, but to ourselves. Because when you have gifts and when you have, and we're all, we're, you know what, we're, my, my philosophy is we're all here to help each other through. Mm -hmm. When you 
don't allow people to own their own stuff. You are crippling them and keeping them from finding their own strength and their own power source within themselves. Yeah. And when you free the people in your life to deal with the stuff that they should be dealing with anyway, and I'm talking about as your children grow and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, you know, kid, it's time you're 20 years old, make your own <laughs> dentist appointment, right. you know, like, <laughs> right. My philosophy, your teeth, right? <laughs> right. My philosophy is, is that you raise the baby bird, but at some point you have to shove the bird out of the nest and see if it flies. You and know, shove is the right word right, because, because they're not going to want to go. <laughs> no. Why would anybody? Oh right. yeah. Mom will take care of it. Nest. Mom will fix it. Mom will do it. You know, right. And, and we're, you know, the stuff that you're asking them to do, to do is just manage your own life, right? right. Manage your own life so I can do other things, you right. know, my, my, and, and really we, it's a matter of self-respect too. You have to respect yourself enough to know this is not the end of your road to be yes. making dentist appointments for yeah. everybody and picking up other people's dry cleaning. And that doesn't mean we don't help our families. Right. That doesn't mean that what it I, means yeah. is we don't own everybody else's stuff as our own right and i think as moms too we take on that identity I, i'm not speaking for me because i'm one of these moms that i'm like you figure it out figure it out <laughs> but <laughs> but i mean i think most moms come into that identity like i'm a mom so i need to take care of this person and that is my role until they're self-sufficient enough no it's yeah, not <laughs> it's not <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I think that's exactly right. And we, and we um, you know, the world has changed when, you know, generations ago, when you were 18, that was it. Bye, figure that's it out. Right, right. And now, because of the economy and a lot of kids coming back home after college, it used to be that when you went to college, that you left home. Right. And most of the time, you didn't come back, or it was for very, very brief periods of time. But now, college kids are coming home again. So yeah. the, the thing that we have to recognize is, that's a transition. So now it's also time to make a transition in how that happens. You're not going to prevent college kids from coming home because they need a place to live, but you can prevent them re from reverting back into 10 year olds. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. You have to pay rent. You have to do your dishes. <laughs> you yeah. Have to do your and laundry. occasionally make your own food because right. this is not a kitchen that no. you know, it's not a restaurant here. So we have to, what, I, mean, I guess the best way to say it is empower them yes, to be independent because that's yeah. the goal. You want to raise functioning adults. Yes. You don't want to yes. raise 10 year olds in adult bodies. Right, right. Um, it's funny because when I was reading your book the other day, you were talking about dinner and um, being a short order cook, basically. And I don't know how many years ago it was. So, like, when I prepare my food, I, my food, I would always kind of prep. So, I would cook like four pounds of chicken, you know, um, a bucket full of broccoli and like a pound of yams at one shot. And I found like I was doing that and then I was making dinners. And of course, no one liked the dinner. Everybody was either in soccer or going places or my husband would come home late. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, ridiculous. So now I just make a bunch of food and I'm like, you can pick whatever you want, put it on a plate, <laughs> heat it up. It's That's what that microwave's for. for. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's what that thing's for. And you know what? There's and and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And yeah. and here's the thing: if you don't like it, make something else. That's right. Yeah. And I or feel eat like eat a bowl of cereal. <laughs> I, I don't care. You'll survive. Right. You know, right. In the house. So I, I think that particular chapter that you were referring to in the book is, is thou shalt stop shoulding thyself. Mm, yes. <laughs> and we do that. Well, I should do this. No, 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 you, you don't you have, have to change to. it into I must or I want. Right. And if it's something you must do, and that's something you can cut to the chase very quickly. If I don't make dinner for them, are they going to starve? Nope. Nope. <laughs> No. Nope. Do Especially I want with to make dinner and everything for them? else? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do I want to make dinner for them? That's fine, as long right. as it doesn't become a should. Yes, you I agree. Put these, you know, obligations on yourself that really don't serve anybody except the recipients right, of right. largesse. You know. Yeah, and I think too, like I know um, there's certain expectations. I think that moms think, like I know I was talking to somebody about my dinner. You know quote unquote dinner <laughs> for the family. Sometimes we eat together, sometimes we don't. And they were like horrified because they were like, dinner is the most important meal. It's the family engagement Ugh. and all this stuff. And I was like, that doesn't bother me. I, my kids are 
are very well-rounded children. Like, I don't think they're being scarred by it (laughs) and it works for us. So like, I think that's another thing where, you know, I think from the, the 1940s TV that we have these visions of, you know, June Cleaver waiting on the husband and having the dinner. I think there's, there's some of them have gotten kicked out, but like, there's still some expectations as a mom. And I feel like, if that's not serving you, then why do it? And that's the key. You know, it has to be, if you are operating from a place of your value system and care and concern, and yes, there is a point where we have to make sure we're spending enough time with our families. And it is important to get everybody together, but you have to do what works for you. Yes. And you have to give yourself the freedom and the grace and the permission to say, this doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for my family. And that's okay. Yeah. If it's (laughs) causing additional stress, then it's not not working. (laughs) It's not okay. So, you know, you find another way. Like if you can't all have dinner together, maybe you do a 10 minute check-in before everybody heads off to bed. Like, right. hey, let's just sit around and chat for 10 minutes. How was your day? How was your day? How was your day? You know, right. th- there, are, there are different ways, but we have to stop deciding for everybody else yes. what right. they should be doing. Right. right. You decide that for you and let me decide it for me. Right. Which I think is interesting with, with everything that is going on with the coronavirus. You know, people are kind of being forced to be with their family. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. It's not working for everybody. <laughs> it's probably not. <laughs> but it's interesting. Like, you know, I was playing uh, checkers with my daughter who, let's just say she beat me. <laughs> beat me quickly. <laughs> I was like, when did this happen? That you were all of a sudden beating me in games. When did you get games? smarter than yeah. me? <laughs> <laughs> like, so, but um, it's interesting because, you know, you're finding new ways to get involved with your kids than a lot of people, you know, I'm not running to soccer practices and stuff like that. So um, you have extra time and finding things to do together is, is definitely going back to old school, you know, where. Yeah. And I think it's about making those connections and those are going to happen in various ways. It's just, it's important to not substitute one set of constraints for another. True. You know, yeah. we, you let it evolve. You're, you're stuck in the house. You're going <laughs> to, you have to spend time together. So, <laughs> Allow yourself to see what works and don't force everybody to sit down to dinner. I mean, you know, we're all together all day at this point. So if somebody wants to watch TV while they're eating dinner, okay, right, right. have your space. But, you know, again, operate from the value system that's important to you. Make time to check in, but don't insist that it's somebody else's version of what should be. Right, right. You had mentioned that too in the book um, about vacationing together, which I love, like, um, it's funny because we're big Disney people too. Oh my and- gosh, me too! <laughs> I can't wait till it opens I know, up and I like, go back there again. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am not the planner per se, but my husband. Sorry, I'm throwing him under the bus, but he's very meticulous about everything. And um, but I loved what you said about like you know, even though it's vacation and we're kind of expected to spend time together, but there are times when you just you need to separate. You need to, and I think taking that into what's going on now too is important too. Like if they want to plug in and, or plug out of, you know, what's going on in the home, let them, you know, it's not going to, it's probably going to be beneficial for everyone. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. I mean, I, you know, you hear these idyllic stories of how people go on vacation and, oh, everybody left their devices, you know, in a basket at the front door and nobody tuned in. And I'm like, I would, we would kill each other if we were a whole week, you know, like that. Yeah. And hey, again, if it works for you, that's great. But right. if everybody needs to just get the heck away from each other and plug into something <laughs> and be in their own little zone for a while, that's, that's okay, okay too. too. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. okay too. Good. Whatever works. Do what works. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about how you're taking the Brilliantly Resilient, because I saw the event, how you're taking that live. And you're doing this on Facebook, is that correct? We're, well, we, you know, everybody and their brother, mother, sister, and everybody else is on Facebook right now and on the internet. So we, we, tr- we are trying to do live shows. We're doing a show every day, which is insane. But we're doing it every single day. We're just trying to get on um, – 
and, and we're trying to talk to different people who are positive and who have great energy and all that. And just for about a half an hour every day. So we're trying to stream them live. We've been playing around with different times because mm. of bandwidth issues. We can't always get uh. it to go live. We're having, we're having some issues mm. with that, but um, because we're having guests. So it's one thing if you're doing a Facebook live by yourself, if you're having other people at any rate, the technology, right, right. it, it it's not exactly cooperating, but um, what we're trying to do is talk to people who um, are sharing their tips on resilience and how we can all stay connected and just some really interesting people. Um, we are recording the shows. So once they are, um, once we're done with the live shows, we're putting them up. We have a YouTube channel now, Brilliantly Resilient. We're starting to load the shows on there and we're also taking the audio portion of it and making oh. it a podcast. So oh, awesome. all of this stuff is, is in the works. We're, we're loading, like I said, we're loading up the shows and all that, but we, we started, I guess last week we started with it and, um, you know, it's it's just an opportunity to take this message that we all have an inherent resilience. It's already there. You don't have to, you don't have to create it. Mm. It's already there. You, the fact that you walk and talk, means that you're inherently resilient. You didn't do those things the first time you tried them <laughs> as a baby. Right, right. We don't name it as children, but it's inherent in us. So now's the time that we all have to, people go, oh, I'm not resilient. Yeah, you are. You, you absolutely are. So we're just trying to encourage people to recognize that and to um, be aware, especially in this time when we're having to find different, interesting, creative ways to do things, to be aware of the skill sets that you're bringing to these things. We all have mm. these skill sets that we tend to apply in one area of life and think, well, I do that there. Mm -hmm. But many of these skills that we have are transferable. And now we have to figure out, like recognize that it is a skill you have. And let's see, how can we take it and use it in other areas? And that's where it becomes your brilliance. Right, right. You know, that's where it becomes that thing that you're really good at and that you can use in different areas. So we're trying to get that out there to people, especially in this this time when our norms have been changed for us. So let's see how we can take these inherent skills that we have and, and move them to different places and yeah. use them in different ways. So um, so if anybody wants you on the Facebook live they can go to your website or to the brilliant go resilient. to yeah brilliantly resilient uh, community page we have a community page okay. and join the community page so you'll be able to see the lives from there if it's you know if we can get it to go live <laughs> okay. and then after the fact we are reposting those so i'm posting them on my pages which uh you know mary fran bon tempo we're posting them on brilliantly resilient we have a youtube channel now so we're just trying to get it out all over the place we will soon enough be ubiquitous and you won't be able to not find us <laughs> Good. and um if anybody wants any information i will have it in my show notes um, under this and also any, you know, how you can reach Mary uh, Fran at her website too. So, but her website is Mary Fran Bontempo, B-O-N-T-E-M. -E -M. I'm going to say that -E -M. again. Just like it sounds. That's where I always tell people. Bon Tempo. 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 <laughs> <laughs> dot com. And then we have brilliantlyresilient.net is also yep. the website for Brilliantly Resilient. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, Kristen and I are also on a four chicks chatting podcast that, that tends to be a little, we, we started it to be a little bit more business oriented, but we also talk about life stuff there. But, um, Kristen and I are really working on this brilliantly resilient. And again, the 15 minute master, you can get that book and mm -hmm. all of my books, um, on Amazon. Okay. So they're all, they're all available there. Um, I have, do you want to, do you want to talk a little bit more about the 15 master, uh, minute master? Because I think we started to, and then. Yeah. So the divided. 15 minute master, when we, when we were in the midst of dealing with everything with David, um, people would say to us, Oh, well, you're just going to have to take it one day at a time. And my husband and I would be like, well, you've never lived with a drug addict because mm -hmm. life changes talk about exponentially it like this with when you're with a drug addict it, it's just the inmates are running the asylum so we used to say we were down to 15 minutes at a time and that was how we got through it we got through 15 minutes okay I can do anything for 15 minutes mm -hmm. I can get through anything mm -hmm. in 15 minute chunks mm 
So it started out as that, as this idea of just staying in that present moment and dealing with that 15 minute time period. And if you kept going through the day like that, before you know it, the worst of it is in your rear view mirror. Mm. So that was where that philosophy started. And then I began to realize that the, the additional part of that process became almost like a system. It was our, I started asking myself three questions. Mm -hmm. All right, so in this 15 minutes, what can I do? Not what do I want to do, because what I want to do <laughs> is for all this to go away. Yeah. <laughs> but what can I do? And that meant what is within my power in this situation? Mm. What resources do I have to address this? What knowledge do I have to address this? Mm. So the what can I do became a question in starting to formulate a plan. So this whole thing then became a process because then it was, all right, I can do this, but what should I do? Mm. Should I act on this right now? Is this any of my business? I think we need to change that to must or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. What must I do, I do and what do I want to do now? <laughs> right. Um, so it became a matter of, is acting going to make this better mm. or worse? Right. Or am I going to insert myself into something that's going to add more on my plate that I don't need to do right now? Mm. And then the third question then finally became, well, what am I going to do? Right. And that question became um, influenced by three other things. Is courage called for here? Do I need to dive into this, even though I don't want to? Mm. Do I need to address this? You know, Winston Churchill famously said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Right. You know, like, <laughs> don't stay don't there. Stop. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't hang don't out. Don't stop. Have coffee. Don't hang there. <laughs> keep going. So mm. sometimes courage is called for. Yeah. Sometimes doing nothing is called for right. and letting the situation evolve mm. and see what happens. Sometimes that is called for yeah. and sometimes retreat is called for. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes just get out of it and either let somebody else step in or give yourself a rest or whatever. So what ended up happening was this whole 15 minute master thing started with, all right, I, I just have to get through the next 15 minutes. And then it was like, all right, what can I do to get through the next 15 minutes? And then beyond, it turned out to be beyond because right. what ends up happening is I came up with one single action step. What one thing can you do after answering those three questions that's going to influence this situation and move it forward? Right, right. So it becomes an action plan that you can institute for bigger things. Yeah. yeah. Beyond and, 15 minute time frame. Right. Right. And not even if you're going through that situation. I mean, you can use that for business. You can it, use yeah. That. It doesn't have to be. It yeah. certainly, it applies across the board. And that was the beauty of it after we were in the, after we were out of the worst of the crisis, it was something that I found myself continuing to mm -hmm. use. And I thought, you know, this does work for everything. So I, yeah. I wrote the book with the full story attached, but saying, look, you can use this beyond a crisis. Right. And even, you know, like you said, everyday life, what can I do? What should I do? What am I going to do? I think too, when um, something like that happens or like even take the coronavirus, like I feel like everyone feels like they're at the effect of what's happening to them. And I think that they feel powerless mm -hmm. and out of control. Um, and as women, we like to be in control yep. <laughs> at all times, usually. Oh, yes. um, and I think knowing that you have an option, like mm -hmm. you do, you get to make choices and you get to decide what you do regardless of what is going on around you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very empowering for women, um, especially knowing, you know, knowing that you have a choice that you, you can make a decision that's either going to move you forward or move you back or keep you right where you are. But yeah. you ultimately have a choice that you can make. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to, the beauty of this is one of the first things I, that I say in setting this whole 15 and it is a system. It is a 15 minute system. There's a two minute setup. There's, um, you know, a three, how did I do this? There's, <laughs> How did I do this? <laughs> there is a setup. I can't even remember how I did it, but you allow yourself a certain time frame for thinking about each of these questions. Mm. Um, and you, 
you know, when you do that, the first thing that you start off doing is saying, is this problem real? Mm -hmm. right. Is it real? Because we all have a tendency to make things, you know, bigger. Yeah. And then the next part of it is, is it, is what is the root of it? Mm. What is the root of the problem? Not what is the offshoot of it? What is mm. the root of this problem? Right. And so then, instead you know, of putting a Band-Aid on it, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Well, instead of not even so much that as are you treating the root of the problem or are you treating a symptom of the problem? Oh, okay. Yeah. For example, um, and I use this story in the book. I have a friend whom I went out to dinner with one night. This was a while back and obviously. And um, she said that before she left, her adult children were saying, oh, oh, aren't you going to make, can't you make dinner for us? So <laughs> She did before uh -huh. she went out and had dinner on her own. But then when she went home, they hadn't done the dishes. Mm. They left them in. So is the problem that they left the dishes in the sink or is the problem that she's she behaving is, yeah. in a certain way mm -hmm. that allows them? So you have to get yeah. to the root of the problem. It's not yelling at everybody to clean up the dishes. It's saying, I'm not going to make dinner for you. Make your own dinner occasionally. So you get to the root of the problem and decide if it's a real problem in the first two minutes. The can question and the should question require about five minutes each. So you're up mm. to 12 minutes. And then the last three minutes are, what are you going to do? Because at that point, it should become kind of clear what you think you're going to do. Yeah. I love that you have um, time limits on it too, because yeah. we can spiral down that rabbit hole big time if you just let your brain wander on, you know, what's going on or whatever. Yeah. And I think sometimes giving yourself a time limit of going, okay, I'm setting a timer. I'm going to vent about this or whatever. It's five minutes and then move on at that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that, I think a time frame is very important because we can coulda, woulda, shoulda ourselves to death right. about, right. about, you know, how things might've gone. You know, I'm a, I'm the master of, if you need a mountain, I can make one out of any molehill. <laughs> I am really good at that. So I think in terms of constraining our spinning minds, which are our greatest blessing and can be our greatest curse, yes. you, that can, that time constraint keeps you, it keeps you from going off places that are not helpful. Right. And also the time too, that you spend spinning, like say you take a day of spinning, you could have spent 12 hours of that being productive and doing something to move you forward rather than yeah. keep you stuck in the same spot that you're in. And when you repeat that process over and over again, so you institute that action step, you see what happens mm -hmm. and then you go back to it. All right. So now, now in this next 15 minutes, knowing that this action step had this effect and you have to give stuff a chance to, to evolve. Right. When you, when you institute something, you have to wait and see what happens. You don't just, do the next thing, right. like, give yourself some time <laughs> and the situation to percolate a little bit and see what happens. Sometimes that's going to be an immediate effect. And sometimes it's going to take a little bit more time to see what that action step, what effect it had on something. But yeah. you know, it, it's a, it's a process to slow down our spinning minds and put it in a, in a very specific framework to see, okay, let's see what happens next. Because we are emotional creatures and we mm -hmm. tend to react on the basis of that. And I, I am the worst when it comes to that. So <laughs> I needed to do this for myself that came out of that really emotional time of my son being in the throes of active addiction, but yeah. it worked for me and it calmed, if it can calm this brain down, <laughs> it can calm it can down anybody. <laughs> So you can um, get your books, uh, you said Amazon? Amazon, yep. And they're I'm, all on Amazon. The other two, two of them are, two, three of them are on Barnes & Noble, but they're all I was going to say, yeah. Amazon. I know yeah. Um, I ordered the two um, from Barnes & Noble. Barnes & so Noble, yeah. definitely mm -hmm. just Google Mary Fran Bon Tempo, and yep. I know they popped up for me as well. So you can definitely grab them. Um, okay, so... So hey, I'm waiting for the speed round. I want to hear the speed round questions. I'm excited for that. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to one of these questions that I'm going to ask you, but I will let you. Okay. <laughs> fill us in. Okay. So the speed round, basically for anybody new listening is I'm just going to throw out some questions. They're very easy to answer. Um, try to answer as quickly as possible. So try not to like hold back as to what you're going to say. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Let's okay. go. What is your favorite song to sing? My favorite song, honestly, is Somewhere Over the Rainbow. 
somewhere over the rainbow. Although I sing You Are My Sunshine constantly on FaceTime to the grandbabies Okay, now. I was going to say, that must be for your grandkids. <laughs> but Somewhere Over the Rainbow is, is my favorite song. Now, do you like different versions of that? Because I know I heard a version, um, and it's, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he's, I believe he's Hawaiian. Yeah, nobody can remember his name. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I think he's, his first name's Isaiah or something like that, oh uh, which doesn't sound Hawaiian, playlist, but, but yeah, yeah. Kukamaka, Lucky, whatever it is, I don't know. <laughs> I can't say it, um, but I do love that version. Yeah. of the song and i love all songs like that like uh, um what a wonderful world the uh, louis armstrong oh, okay. one. i love yeah. that too you know yeah. all those all those songs that you know make you a little teary-eyed i love those yeah growing up so i don't know if you know this but i was a professional ballet dancer um, oh my before. gosh yeah and but my mom actually brought me up on all the musicals oh like, yeah so oh. all the I'm old a musical black theater and geek. And, yeah oh yeah yeah oh um, yeah because i was this, i believe it or not i am a professionally trained singer Oh, yeah. Would you like to sing something for no. us? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't sing too much anymore. I got some throat things going on, but uh, I, I do. Yeah. I did sing for a long time, church singer mostly, but oh, okay. shows and all that stuff. Yeah, when I was little, um, I think it wasn't Blockbuster, but it was something similar to Movies Unlimited was a store, and you went in and rented the v VHSs. And they knew me by name because I was the only like teenage girl that would go in and or and get like Cary Grant movies and like oh my Audrey gosh, Hepburn so and funny. musicals. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. All right. So next question. Coffee or tea? I'm a tea drinker, but I am dying for a good cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee right now. <laughs> You can go through drive through I know you can. I know you can. I just haven't been out of the house much. Wipe so down I haven't. the cup. <laughs> right? I know. That's where my, my neurotic mind is going. I'm like, oh, yeah, but they're touching the cup. Do I yeah. want to? I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I can't wait to go back and get a nice cup of Dunkin', but I'm a tea drinker. Um, now, because I know you're a Disney fan now. Oh, I am a Disney freak. Yeah. Okay. Well, wait a second. They have the best coffee. My husband got it for me really? for Christmas. It's Joffrey's Coffee. A coffee? Yeah. Um, oh my I know, I'll have to find the link for you and I'll send it to you because he ordered it. But um, it's Kona Coffee from the Polynesian, um, Victorian oh. Albert's Coffee. Um, there's a decaf version and something else. But I'm a big coffee person, so like, and the Kona oh, Coffee. I'll have is to so try delicious. that. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a not very good coffee maker, but hopefully, if they can figure <laughs> out a way to make it foolproof, I'll go for that. There you go. <laughs> Um, I did see a funny meme today. They were saying about how um, it was something like, how are you doing today? And they're like, I'm fine. I wiped down the Lysol container <laughs> with Lysol. <laughs> oh my God. Um, the funniest funny. memes have come out of uh, the coronavirus. All right. My so girlfriend the other day, my girlfriend took a picture of herself on Facebook and she's, she's my age. She's a grandparent and all. And she said, I'm trying to keep busy with a puzzle during the coronavirus. And it was a little kid's puzzle to have four pieces. <laughs> and she was like, <laughs> so turning funny. it <laughs> yeah um all right so next question most influential person in your life oh my gosh i might be a tough one <laughs> wow that is a tough one um i would have to say and this is going to sound crazy but it's probably my five-year-old granddaughter oh awesome because she, she has changed my perspective on everything now she your oldest grandchild she's the oldest yeah okay. and that's probably why because she's the oldest yeah i mean all of the grandbabies are my are the people who influence me the most now because they're i think about them all the time but when that comes back into your life and you're not on the front lines mm -hmm. of worry about raising a child and and all that you it is the most wondrous place <laughs> to be back into that world where you look at things from a child's eyes and you think about how they are processing things and all it, it's you know as a, when you're a mom you're, you're on the front line and you're worried and you're taken care of and you're, you're constantly in that that care frame well I get to play yes and and I get to you know hear their thoughts and their questions and their, you know, how their little minds are working and see the world through them. So I would say all of them, but because she's the first and, and is going through the stages now, mm. she's five. five. She's that's probably the age. most influential person for Aww, me. Yeah. That's cute. <laughs> yeah, she is. All right. So what is your favorite book and why? My favorite book is Bird by Bird. And it's written by Anne Lamott, and it's basically about writing, but Anne Lamott is 
an amazing, amazing human. Mm -hmm. She has, has, she's an alcoholic and she freely writes about that, that she struggled with that. But her faith journey that Mm -hmm. she imbues in all of her writing and all of her books and her way that she looks at the world, you don't have to be interested in writing to get so much out of Anne Lamott. She is, Mm -hmm. she's amazing. And I read, and I've read, and I read it all the time. Like I just go back to it and then I reread it and I reread it. And, you know, she, the book was written when her son was a little boy and he's now in his twenties, I think at least. Mm -hmm. But, um, it's very, it's, she's touching She's genuine. She's funny. Mm. It's really funny. She's smart. And um, her experiences of, of dealing with her alcoholism and how she found faith communities and all that. Um, and I think the other book that she wrote is, tra- is it Traveling Mercies or Tender Mercies? One or the other. But Anne Lamott. Just Anne read Lamott. Anne Lamott. <laughs> She's so I'll good. I'll definitely have to check that out. Yeah, you'll like it. She's good. All right. Favorite movie, which I think I know the answer to this question. <laughs> I'm going to be shocked Wizard if you say, yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and I only know that a from. close second followed by Mary Poppins. Oh, yes. Yes. It has to be the original. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah exactly. Oh, yeah. The, <laughs> the second one is cute, but it's, it's, the, it's the first one with just different. The second oh, Mary Poppins, it's yeah, it's exactly yeah, like the first, it. like you can literally could go, okay, well, that's this scene. Okay, well, that's oh, this scene. Okay, well, that's this scene, you know. Oh, yeah. But at any rate, um, it's The Wizard of Oz. That's there's no, favorite, there's yeah. no question. <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. And my favorite character, as you know, is the Cowardly Lion. It's, yes, it's funny because um, yesterday, so we live on a decent sized property, like we have eight acres. And um, oh, wow. so from the house to our pole barn, which we have like, freezer food and stuff like that. My daughter was riding her bike down to go to the pole barn. And I told, I turned to my husband and I was like, she looks like the wicked witch. The sculpt. (laughs) 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 Because her seat was so low. Oh my gosh, that's too funny. That's too funny. Yeah, (laughs) it's the best movie ever. I mean, it just has so many... There's just so much to get out of that movie. I, I, I watch it every time it's on and I learn something new every time i mean yeah. it's just it's it's it's, a it's, a, it's about all good stuff you know yeah. it's yeah it's about being genuine and being brave and being kind and and not being able to say knock it off you know like when somebody's <laughs> doing something that they shouldn't do it's got mm-hmm. everything yeah i want to um read i wasn't wanted to see wicked i didn't get to see wicked yet but Me i want to i want to read this the stories about the witches and i think that would be that'd yeah be cool yeah those are those are interesting. I've not seen it either, but I have I know enough about it to know that the way they treat the wicked witch, she wasn't born wicked. Uh, and that's the thing that I think is important to recognize yeah. that the way we the way we treat people, the way we interact with people, that's not to say there aren't just people that are bad seeds and born bad, but but the way we interact with people can have a lot to do with the people that they become. So we have to be conscious of that. Right. Right. I think when people are born, I feel like everybody's worthy of love and, Mm -hmm. you know, coming to this world. But I do think too, I mean, there's some horrible things that have happened to some people and they've overcome them, Mm -hmm. but yet I think it depends on which path you decide to go down. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Uh, Okay. So last question, inspirational quote. Oh my gosh. Um, I I don't know. That's really, that's a really tough one. I, I will say this, um, Kristen Smedley and I doing this whole brilliantly resilient thing. Um, we, we, we both have honed in on things that we, that we've written. And the one thing, and I won't say it's my favorite, but it rings true with me that I say, whenever you, you are in a crisis or in a challenging situation because sometimes life just sucks. You have a decision to make. Mm. Are you going to live there or are you just visiting? Mm. Like, like make that decision. And then the thing that Kristen says is you can also make the decision to, that you can come through a crisis either broken or brilliant. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah. I, I like both of those. And I mean, I'm, I'm, of course, we're the ones that, but they're the ones that are uppermost in my mind <laughs> right. right now. Right, it's right. not that I'm putting us out there as right. no, no, no. like that. <laughs> um, but 
Um, you know, I think the other thing that kind of rings true to me is, and this is kind of going to kind of sound silly, but at the end of her show, um, every day, Ellen DeGeneres says, be kind to one another. Yeah. And I, you know, you don't get more basic than that. And no. if we could all just do that, the world would be a better place. Yeah. And I think being accepting of people and mm -hmm. what, like, you know, kind of what we were touching on earlier about like, you know, um, their values and what you feel you should or shouldn't be doing. Don't, not everybody's expectations in life are the same as yours and yeah, what your standards yeah. are, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. that's very true. And, uh, and I think, you know, you just to kind of bring this whole thing full circle, you had said at the earlier when you were at the event that we had the brilliantly resilient, you kind of felt like you were with your tribe and your village. And I think yeah. that we all have to think about life on this planet that way. Like we are all part of a village, find yeah. the people that resonate with you because not everybody's going to, and that's fine, right. but find the people that resonate with you and share your values and, um, and, and don't be afraid to reach out to people that you might not think are, are in your village. You know, and I, I think about this world of addiction, it mm -hmm. can be very isolating. Um, and, and we want people when I, when I do the work that I do with dream life recovery, we want people to understand that you're not, you're not in a box because something is happening to you right now. Mm -hmm. You still mm -hmm. have, you know, access out to people and reach out to people that you might not ordinarily think would be people that would be in your tribe because yeah. they might be the ones who have resources for you right, right now. So, you know, um, I mean, hey, if you're struggling with addiction, reach out to my son. You know, his name's Dave Bontempo. Find him on Facebook. Find him through Dream Life Recovery. Find, you know, t take the opportunities to go outside, again, bringing back to the idea of your comfort zone, go outside of your comfort village and maybe reach out to somebody new who you might find a connection with and find a way to impact the world in a better way. Um, mm. I mean, you and I up to a few weeks ago didn't know one another at that's all. Right. That's right. So, right. you know, this is somebody, um, you know, our, our collaboration on this is something that hopefully we're bringing some positive stuff to the world. But yes, have your village, but always look to expand your village. Right. I think, too, reaching out to some people who you don't think are your tribe, they may want to reach out to you, but are hesitant to reach out. You yeah. know, and I think that's another thing that, you know, we, we sometimes feel like we don't belong in the group. You know, and if you're the outsider, it's, it's kind of hard to kind of get in. And I think in, involving everyone, you know, and they get to decide whether they want to stay in the tribe or not. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> you know? exactly right. You know, yeah. and the truth of the matter is nobody belongs in the group because the group doesn't exist until somebody joins it. Right. So nobody belong, like nobody has an inherent right to be a part of anything. We all figure it out as we go and see if it resonates with us and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the worst that can happen is somebody says, no, no. <laughs> and you go, okay, well, right. I guess you're <laughs> not around. my people. Yeah, that's you're right. not my people. So I'll go find my people somewhere else. Yeah. And that's fine. That, that is that is absolutely fine. You right. know, it trial, it's all trial and error. Like this life is trial and error, but just make sure you try. Yes. Yeah. Step out of that comfort zone. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. I really hope this was helpful for many people. I'm sure it will be. And like I had said before, all the show notes will include Mary Fran's links. Um, it, I'll also include dream life link there oh, yeah. as well. So if yes, anybody yes, is yes. struggling with addiction, um, they can definitely reach out to them. I know I met um, Diana. Diana. Yes. The, Diana mm -hmm. Dubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was super nice. She's so, lovely. Yeah. And um, you know, these are, these are our people who, the thing that I like about this group particularly is that they all have very authentic stories that are often grounded in that world. So they know what's going on and they can um, reach out to you from a place of genuine compassion. So anybody who is struggling, or even if, if you're not struggling, but you know someone who is struggling and you're having trouble managing that, because mm. that's hard too, you know, yeah. to be, to be associated with that when you can't fix it for somebody. That's yeah. hard. Yeah. So. Right. so thank you again so much. I really oh, appreciate you taking pleasure. the time out and I really oh, enjoyed yeah. speaking to you. <laughs> it was great. It was great. We all know that we need to move more and eat less, but why isn't it working? Why can't I keep this weight off? I too used to ask the same exact question. Why is this not working? And then I found out it's the way I think about things. 
and it's the mindset part that is the missing link and this is what i give my clients like there's no magic there's no woohoo it's very concrete and it's amazing if you can get your mind in the right spot how easily the weight will come off and i want to teach you these skills i want to teach you so you never have to diet ever again so if you are ready to ditch the diets for good head over to shapeitupfitness.com today and schedule your free consult with me